Welcome to How to Ensure That Redistricting is Fair, Open and Accessible. I'm Ruth Greenwood. I'm the Co-Director of Voting Rights and Redistricting at the Campaign Legal Centre, CLC. Thank you for joining us. Um, CLC is a national nonprofit organisation that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process and we believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable and inclusive. Today, I'm excited to serve as your moderator for our discussion on why strong ethics provisions are vital for ensuring a transparent and accountable redistricting process. Our panel uh, will share their insights on where and how we can have meaningful opportunities to offer feedback on the maps drawn by encouraging each state to create robust ethics rules to govern its redistricting commission or redistricting process more broadly, we can increase public trust and promote a healthier democracy. After today's event, I invite you to visit campaignlegal.org uh, to read the new report, Designing a Transparent and Ethical Redistricting Process, a guide to ensuring that the redistricting process is fair, open and accessible. This is a joint project of CLC and the League of Women Voters. Uh, before I introduce today's panel, I will just review a few housekeeping items uh, for this afternoon's discussion. First, uh, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for members of the panel. After we have heard from the panel, we will start the question and answer portion of today's event. Uh, we will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer them all. Um, if we aren't able to answer your question and you are a member of the press, um, please feel free to email your questions to media at campaignlegal.org. Um, and if you are a member of the public and we can't answer your question, please email info at campaignlegal.org. Okay, now I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, Christopher Lamar is a legal counsel in redistricting at CLC, where he primarily focuses on creating, protecting and implementing independent redistricting commissions or IRCs. He has presented at conferences nationwide to discuss IRCs and partisan gerrymandering. He has helped draft IRCs for numerous states and advocated for them in state legislatures across the country. He's also a pretty good trial lawyer. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Delaney Masco, Senior Legal Counsel for Ethics at CLC, uh, where she works on matters related to government, ethics, accountability, and transparency at the state and federal levels, which means she's been very busy for the last four years. Her career has been driven by the notion that public interest should be put above private gain. Uh, Jeanette Senegal is the Senior Director of Mission Impact at the League of Women Voters. Uh, Jeanette head, leads the League's efforts on issues such as reforming and modernizing election laws and expanding civic engagement and empowerment opportunities for all voters. She heads up the Public Advocacy for Voter Protection Project and voter registration programs in high schools, community colleges, and naturalization ceremonies that protect and reach the nation's underrepresented voters. She's also one of the first people I met in the voting rights world many eons ago when I joined. Um, and the final member of our panel is Ellen Frieden, a Miami lawyer who worked uh, as the campaign chair for Fair Districts Florida and championed the successful citizens initiative to outlaw gerrymandering in 2010. After the 2012 state legislature, <laughs> Um, did an end run around the new constitutional provisions. Ellen led five years of litigation to challenge the illegal maps in court. And most importantly, she won, including 11 published opinions from the Florida Supreme Court. As a result of this work, Florida's illegally uh, drawn 2012 congressional and Senate maps were held invalid and new maps, which have leveled the playing field, were adopted. She's a unicorn. <laughs> Thank you to all of our members for joining the panel today. I'm sure this will be a great discussion. Uh, so let's start, and I'll start with you. What are redistricting commissions and how do they differ in the amount of power they hold over the redistricting process from legislatures? Thanks so much, Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In most states, the state legislature draws congressional and state legislative district boundaries. However, some states do give the power of redistricting to commissions. And these can generally be grouped into four different categories. There are independent commissions that take the power of redistricting out of the hands of legislators and in fact have regulations limiting direct participation by elected officials. Each state with an independent redistricting commission has a different structure and has different internal checks and balances. And these factors are critical to, this, to the success of the commissions. 
But the commission's real aim is to create boundaries that are not beholden to any political party. The second type of commission is a bipartisan commission or a political commission. This type of commission takes the power away from the legislature, but gives it to the major parties. The, these commissions differ by state as well uh, about how they're implemented, but the commonality here is that current elected officials may serve as members. The third category is an advisory commission. Now these do not take the legal power of redistricting away from the legislature and advisory commissions recommend district plans in some states. The legislature can adopt them, can change them, can ignore them altogether because the legislature has the final say. Now these advisory commissions can influence the process depending on the culture of the state and their influence typically occurs as the maps are drawn. Now the last category is really a backup commission and these commissions are used in states but only when the legislature is unable to agree upon a redistricting plan. And therefore they really come into play at the end of the process. So the legislature has gone through multiple rounds often and they haven't been able to come up with a plan. And so the, a, a backup commission will be implemented in their state based on their, their laws. So those are the general four kinds of redistricting commissions that exist. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, so in this sea of commissions and legislatures, Chris, can you tell us um, a little bit about the new report and how it came about? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, even before I joined CLC, CLC was already engaged in helping states create independent redistricting commissions. And so, for example, in 2018, uh, we, you know, helped voters in several states to enact redistricting reform, for example, in Michigan, uh, Colorado, and a few other states. Um, and so after that, and after I joined CLC, there was a lot of discussion around, I think, twofold. One, I think, was about sort of making sure that the commissions that were created in Michigan and Colorado, for example, were um, can be made as strong as possible, right? And so then I think the next step was in states that wanted to emulate Michigan and Colorado, there was discussions about, you know, what else can we do to sort of uh, build on the commissions that were created in those states in 2018, for example. Um, and so I think the commission, or sorry, the report uh, comes into play there because it sort of answers a lot of the questions that I think, uh, like I have seen, for example, uh, while talking with people in states about what else they would like to do to, or I guess what else can they do to sort of make the redistricting process, um, you know, fair, open and accessible. And I, I think, you know, we talk a lot about uh, in the report, we talk a lot about independent redistricting commissions, but in the in the 12 rules that we're discussing, um, you know, some of those rules are also uh, applicable to places where the state legislature still has uh, a very large role to play in the redistricting process. Okay, well, let's actually get to that. So Delaney, regardless of whether it's a commission or legislatures that are in control, what are some of the steps that states should take to create stringent ethics guidelines to prevent conflicts of interest and maintain impartiality in their redistricting processes? Yeah, so we go into detail um, in the report about what we recommend, but I definitely want to highlight some of some of the high points and some of the major uh, proposals that we have. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to step back and highlight something that you said, Ruth, or you touched on in your introduction. And that's, you know, why this all matters. Um, before implementing any ethics rules, it's important to understand the role that they play in government bodies and why they're so important. And that's because they preserve the public's trust in government. Um, if the public sees redistricting commissions acting with integrity and honoring the basic tenets of ethical public service and sees them actually working in the public's interest, the public's going to buy into the process and trust the process. And that's crucial for something as consequential as the redistricting process. So how can states build and maintain that trust in specifically the process of redistricting? Um, and so I just wanna highlight a few of the specific measures that we, we lay out in the report. Um, so states can prevent conflicts of interest in redistricting by making sure that those who might have a personal political interest in the outcome of the redistricting process are not permitted to be the ones drawing the lines. Um, and so that might mean that uh, a state prohibits lobbyists or political party officials or 
current elected officials from being redistricting commissioners or participating meaningfully in the process. Um, states can also avoid conflicts by prohibiting commissioners from running for office for a period of time after uh, they work on the, on the redistricting process. Um, and those measures are designed to ensure that a commissioner or someone who's working in the process isn't trying to game the process for their own political gain. Um, we also recommend a lot of transparency measures in the report because sunlight is often the best disinfectant and transparency can help prevent and root out those conflicts of interest that we might see. Um, citizen access and public input should be a priority for redistricting commissions. Um, states should consider requiring a certain number of public hearings and providing for public comment periods. And commissions should, just as a rule, make as much data and information public in an accessible format as possible. Um, so that might mean making all data used by the commission public, draft maps, any reports they, they put out, making that accessible to the public. And where it's feasible, making the commission subject to public records laws like uh, Freedom of Information Acts. Um, and just before I like just am talking so much, I just want to kind of end with saying that I know that it can be daunting to think about how we implement ethics reforms and it, it feels sometimes I think politically impossible um, to to put um, to put these reforms in place. But the good news is that a lot of states already have ethics commissions um, which, which deal with conflicts of interest and other conduct issues related to legislators or other public officials. And um, ethics commissions can be thought of as essentially built-in infrastructure that can help implement and administer ethics rules. Um, so where it's practicable, states should consider giving their ethics commissions jurisdiction over the conduct of, of redistricting commissioners. Thank you, Delaney. So I wanted to jump in on something that you said is, even if we can't actually get the conflict of interest out of the process, uh, can we shine sunlight? Will that be enough? Um, and in somewhat of a point counterpoint, I'm gonna go to Ellen Frieden um, to ask you about, I've definitely heard you tell me some stories about the types of things that happen when there isn't transparency in the process, uh, but I think it's important that we all hear about just how bad it can get. So uh, Ellen, go ahead. So thank you, Ruth, and thanks for inviting me to join this great panel. Um, you know, just to, by way of background, we had an experience in Florida where we really got through litigation a peek under the uh, under the curtain at what had happened in redistricting in 2012 redistricting. Um, what we learned is that the legislators were going around the state and they were having public hearings and they were asking for public input. And at every hearing, they announced that they were going to, to uh, that they were gonna have the most open, transparent, interactive, fair redistricting process, not only ever in Florida, but ever in the whole United States of America. And while they were doing that, now the letters, the legis these were the legislative leaders, of course, who were all in one party. And while they were doing that, they actually had political operatives in the Republican Party headquarters in Tallahassee and in Washington who were drawing the maps that they were then going to present as the legislature's maps that were drawn as a result of all these public hearings that they were having. So in addition to doing that, they set up, in addition to the public hearings, they set up a public portal where people could go online and they could actually draw maps. They could submit maps to the legislature to ask the legislature to, you know, to consider using those maps. And they held numerous committee meetings and, and acted as if this was really an open, transparent, interactive and fair process. What we know now is that those maps that were being drawn and way before the legislative committees said they had maps, 
um, that those maps that were that they were drawing at the time that they had those political consultants that they that were getting paid for it by the Republican Party, not by the legislature. Um, those maps were then submitted through that public portal. So they used this facade of openness in order to slip these partisan maps into the system. They put them in under fake names. Some one, one guy whose name they used to put the maps in, we took his deposition in, in that case. And he, under oath, said that he had no idea what this was all about. He had never drawn a map and he certainly had never submitted one. And the email that addressed that, that they had used when they used his name to submit a map wasn't his email, wasn't his real email address. They had just made it up. So, so I'm, I guess you're going to have to color me cynical here <laughs> because I know that having seen it firsthand in Florida, that redistricting is the most political and partisan activity that a legislature ever engages in. Now, I don't really have experience with commissions, so I can't speak to commissions, but I can tell you that um, it took us five years, four and a half years of, of really scorched earth litigation to ferret out all this information and then present it to the courts and the courts ultimately did the right thing and threw those maps out. And I, I probably started at, at the end and should have started at the beginning because in 2010, we did pass in Florida, um, and we amended the constitution to prohibit drawing districts with intent to favor a political party or an incumbent or, um, and, or, Within or to permit or to prohibit the diminishment of minority um, um, voters' ability to select their a, a candidate of their choice, and we had other standards of requirement uh, requirements too. But the bottom line is, is that it was because of those standards that were in the Florida Constitution as a result of a citizens' initiative, which both the CLC and the League of Women Voters were very instrumental in helping us um, pass. Um, because we had those constitutional provisions, that's what why we were able to go to court and 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 establish this proof. Otherwise, there wouldn't even we would never have even been able to to prove this. So um, I don't I don't even have advice for anybody, quite frankly, <laughs> because we're now looking at the same thing again, even though we've got the amendments in place, even though the legislature actually at the end admitted that it had drawn the maps unconstitutionally. Um, I am I have great confidence that this is going to happen all over again, this redistricting cycle. Thank you, Ellen. I think it is good to know uh, the extent of what we are dealing with, um, which is why we wanted to put this together. And also that, you know, are there ways aside from five years of litigation, what, are there things that we can do before we get there? Now, I appreciate, Ellen, you may think absolutely not. Uh, but Chris, I wanted to ask you if there are any um, recommendations in the report that can help with the types of things that um, Ellen identified. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's always such a sobering story to hear. Um, about what happened in the state even after the voters in that state uh, very obviously wanted to get rid of partisan gerrymandering in their redistricting process, right? Um, but I think one of the things that Ellen hit on that I was thinking about when she was saying it was, um, she talked a lot about what they got, what they learned, the things that they learned about from the legislature after litigation started, so like during the discovery process when there's litigation, right? And I was thinking about if you like implement rules around sort of requiring the legislature, for example, to um, like to be forced to disclose all of the, the draft maps and all of the documentation um, and sort of like the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act laws. Um, on the front end, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you may not be able to stop the legislature, but at least you have that data and that information um, beforehand to actually, you know, maybe put on public pressure to maybe get some changes that way, right? Like I think a lot about 
that uh, North Carolina uh, state legislator who, after the North Carolina litigation ended, the legislature was required to change the maps, right? And they had this room, they had this big room with the map was like in the middle of this table and there was like the, the map was on the wall and one of the legislators, not knowing the camera was being recorded, or at least I'm assuming he didn't know that the room was just being live streamed 24 hours, right? Walks in, looks at the map, looks at his district, doesn't like his district, changes a line or two and then walks back out, right? And then it's like, it's in the news the next day, next thing you know, all of a sudden, like he decides he's not running uh, for a state seat anymore. And it's like, why do you think that is, right? And so I, I, I totally, I totally, you know, sympathize with Ellen and, and recognize that, you know, I'm not saying that this report is going to be the end all be all to creating a fair, open and accessible process, but I think it's a step, right? And I, I think the other thing that's really important from what Ellen said was, you know, like Floridians in 2010 were very excited about the Fair Maps Amendment, right? They're very excited about getting the parts and gerrymandering out of uh, state state politics, right? And I think the thing to remember is that just because you enact something does not mean that that's it, or right? like it doesn't mean that that's all you need to do. It means that it's another way, it's another tool in the toolbox, but you have to continue to apply pressure and you sort of have to continue to, uh, you know, pay attention to politicians, right? Like if you give them the opportunity to uh, draw maps in a way that benefits themselves, they will more li in all likelihood do so. And so I think there's, um, you know, we just have to w work to make sure that we create ways for people to uh, have more tools in the toolbox to create a fair, open and uh, transparent democracy. Thank you. Okay, so we have some ideas for things that might work. Um, Jeanette, you have an army of people across the country that are part of uh, the, the league. Uh, what, what do you think that people can do, ordinary people, to try to get these into the hands of legislators and to try to actually uh, make change with the redistricting process beginning later this year? I think there's so many really great threads, you know, coming together across what everybody's saying. You know, it's not just about having better transparency, you also need the public participation. You also need to watch what happens after the process has begun or been finalized and dig into the data. If you have, just because the informa it's transparent, the information's available, if you're not doing anything with it, then it's still not gonna be all that helpful to you. But as far as the recommendations go, you know, we really do wanna get these into the hands of legislators as well as redistricting commissioners. And the best way to do that is really gonna differ by state because all of these, uh, rules are going to be different. So you really have to find out who is controlling the process in your state. Is it specific elected officials? Is it a legislative committee? Is it the redistricting commission? And meet with them or their staff. Talk with them about your community's needs so they understand why you expect, and I mean expect, them to lead a transparent and participatory redistricting process. You can connect with other community leaders, including your local League of Women voters, to see how you can collaborate to get these into the right people's hands. But it, again, it doesn't just stop with the getting the information there. You have to continually talk with them. I mean, advocating for formalized transparency and public participation measures, including what has been discussed already, disclosing timelines, disclosing the decision-making process, disclosing the underlying data sets, disclosing all the consultants and experts that are hired, going back to what Ellen said about people who are drawing maps and submitting them. They were hired by somebody. If that had to be disclosed, that could have been part of the process earlier on and Maybe she wouldn't have to have gone through so much scorched earth uh, litigation to, to get to that information, right? So there are so many different pieces here. It's about advocating early and often. You know, the process hasn't really begun in earnest in most states because the data is not even available, but we do have to start now, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about later. And Ellen clearly wants to jump in. Go for it, Ellen. Well, I do in the, in the sense that the process has begun probably in pretty much all states, even though the data is not available. Because what one of the things that we learned in, in our litigation was that while the legislature was going around having these hearings, they said, and they didn't have full data yet, they said they couldn't be drawing maps. We know that they were already drawing the maps. They were, they had enough data that would allow them to estimate. It wasn't the official data. But they, the process, th these maps are getting drawn right now. The ones, the ones from, um, that are, you know, that are um, uh, certainly the ones that are in the hands of legislatures. 
that's that I would I would venture to say and and I don't and I want to make clear that I don't think although we don't have this haven't had the benefit of this experience in Florida I'm pretty sure that whatever party is in control of the legislature is pretty much doing the same thing if it's if it is um, if it is you know Democratic or Republican whoever it is is going to be they're all going to be very jealous of holding on to their power. And Florida, by the way, has a number of the things on the books that you recommend as rules. They just don't pay any attention to them. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, actually, Ellen. So we can have the rules on the books and we can have sort of public involved. Um, can you speak a little bit about how to garner media attention? Because I think that media pressure, like what Chris was talking about, and I believe he'll be back, he's having some tech issues. Um, but we were talking about, you know, the media showing what was happening in, in North Carolina and that having an effect. Um, I wonder if you can talk about how, what are the ways that you can try to garner media attention for like terrible deeds? <laughs> well, now once our trial started, it wasn't hard at all to get media attention because it was scandalous. It was totally scandalous. The, in order to get media attention though, you've got to feed them something that they consider is newsworthy. So among, you know, the, among the things that we tried that didn't work would be, you know, the trials coming up, here's what we expect to prove, all of that kind of thing. Um, as we were going through discovery, we at times talked to reporters and gave them, you know, little hints of what was to come. But they weren't interested in that until things actually started coming out in open court. And then the the trial, the the, our, the trial on our congressional map was covered, you know, very thoroughly. Um, now, the other things that we have done in the past, and you know, you get some media attention, is we have a coalition of organizations here in Florida, and we'll send out a joint press release signed by 20 organizations, or maybe we'll send a letter to the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, making demands on them to open up a process in some way. In fact, in Florida, I mean, if you can, Florida used to at least pride itself on being the sunshine state, meaning there's sunshine shining on our state government. And, but you know what, guess what's exempted from those public records uh, laws? Anything having to do with redistricting. And, and so we've, you know, been making demands that they that they change that, that they do away with that exemption. So, and put those redistricting records back in the sunshine. And so we're, you know, we're going to be sending a letter to the legislative leaders asking them specifically to do that. And when we do that, of course, that letter will go to the press and maybe we'll have a press conference and, you know, there'll be some mention of it, but it's not going to be a big headline. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I do think the fact of all of these terrible things that were exposed in the last decade will hopefully help the media to understand there is some uh, relevance to getting this, uh, uh, you know, in the media before the five-year trial. Um, and, and to that end, I wonder, Jeanette, if people are listening and watching and they want to be involved, um, what can they do? Great question. Uh, you know, as Ellen said, the process might not have officially started because the data hasn't been released. But in many states, they're they're holding hearings, they're collecting information, they're starting the public participation and the public input uh, process. And so, but we're really anticipating that the the real work when the maps are drawn is going to occur on a really extremely compressed timeline. So it's important that we get started now. We have to find out what groups in your state and community are already engaged in redistricting. And if you don't know where to start, see if there's a League of Women Voters in your community. The League is focused on action in all 50 states and DC through the People Powered Fair Maps. You can also connect with us through the national office uh, and we'll be sharing a link with a, a thing that you can click on to join our group and we can keep you connected and connect you to local leaders in your, your state. I really can't emphasize enough how important it is to get started now because as you're learning who 
is in charge. You also need to learn what their timeline is. We also have to see if they're even posting their timelines for when the maps are gonna be put out there. We need to track when the hearings are happening. There's are so many details to follow, but it's also thinking about how does redistricting impact me and my life so that you know what your story is. Is it that gun violence in your area continues to be uh, out of control because the redistricting, you don't have a person to really champion uh, gun safety in your community because of how the districts have been drawn? Is climate change uh, out of hand in your area because of uh, you don't have the appropriate representation to get that addressed in your state? Is it healthcare issues, right? Like redistricting impacts every single issue that we care about. Redistricting itself often seems very arcane and like very in the weeds and it's so political, but at the end of the day, it impacts our lives in very personal ways every single day. And so thinking about and understanding just personally how it impacts you so that when you have the opportunity to share your story so that legislators and others and commissioners know why you're asking for the, the map that you might be asking for or to inform where your community really lies. I mean, think about who's in your community. What would be the lines that would be the most important to for you so that you had the representation you needed? And it's not just at the congressional and state legislative level, although that's what we've been talking about here today. It is school boards and town councils and city commissioners and mayor, um, uh, judicial districts. I mean, there are so many other districts out there that impact our daily lives and those districts will also be redistricted. So really understanding where your community is and what you would define as your community so that you can be kept together in the districts that are drawn at the end of the day is an important piece, but really connecting with the organizations that are out there on the ground working on this who can help you track the information you need, can help keep you informed about what your when your opportunities are to either participate in a hearing, whether it's to submit your own testimony, whether it's to tell your story, whether it's to organize people in your community who can also tell their stories. There's a lot of work that lots of individuals can do, and there are groups out there who can help you get engaged, like the League and others. Ellen, do you have other thoughts on that? Well, you know, Jeanette said something about that really, that triggered something in, um, in my memory. Um, having to do with specific issues that are important to communities. Um, we, ha in, in, in the maps that finally were court ordered maps that, that were adopted in Florida um, at, at the end of all our litigation, so they weren't in effect till 2016. But as soon as those maps went into effect, we saw policy moderation in our members of Congress and in our legislature. And what made me think of, you mentioned about gun violence. We had, we had a state Senator here in, in Miami, in the Miami area that had been the darling of the NRA. She happened to be on, and I don't remember the name of the committee, but in the Senate, in the state Senate, she was the chair of the committee that all the gun legislation went, the pro gun or anti gun legislation went through. And all of a sudden, because her district became much more competitive, all of a sudden she totally split with the NRA. And it's the it's making districts competitive instead of sure wins for one party or the other that really causes a moderation. We saw the same thing on, on minimum wage questions and members of Congress actually in minimum, who, who had been staunchly against minimum wages for years. And then all of a sudden when their district became more competitive, they sure did come around because they understood, you know, it's a matter of who are they answering to? Are they answering to the, to the voters? Are they answering to the lobbyists? And, and that's why evenly drawn districts, fairly drawn districts and not gerrymandered makes such a difference on policy. Well, that is heartening to hear. <laughs> Hopefully everyone doesn't have to go through five years of litigation to get that wonderful moment. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, to finish up with you, Delaney. Um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about HR1 and we'll go into questions. Um, but Delaney, you're an, an ethics lawyer. Um, and I wondered if people are interested in the role of ethics and transparency in government beyond redistricting, how can, how can people find out more about that? 
Yeah, and I, I love what, what um, Jeanette was saying about how um, important it is to make sure that um, your public officials, redistricting officials are make are acting in the public's interest and not their own interests and not the whole point of ethics laws and rules to begin with. Um, and so that's why this stuff is so important. Um, and if you wanna know more about ethics um, in general, Campaign Legal Center has some great resources on our website. Specifically, if you go to campaignlegal.org slash democracyu, we have information about how to make um, government more transparent and accountable. And you can also poke around uh, the ethics issue page on our website to see the work we're doing at all levels of government to promote transparency and accountability. And the last thing I'll say is if you have questions, you can always contact CLC. I love talking about ethics um, and I'm always available to talk about it. So please let us know if you have any ethics questions. I happen to know from personal experience that is true. Delaney loves talking about ethics, just like how I love talking about redistricting. Um, so we have got some comments about HR1. So I wanted to just give an overview of the redistricting portions of HR1. Um, and I'm taking this myself just because I love HR1. <laughs> um, and CLC has been really involved in um, making recommendations for changes to the language. And I think that it is really strong. So HR1 would require redistricting commissions for every state that they would set one up to draw the congressional districts. It doesn't affect state legislative districting, so there's still a lot of work to be done there, but all congressional districts would be drawn by a commission and there are a whole series of rules that Delaney has vetted about conflicts of interest and, and all the rest of that kind of thing to make sure that the commissions are as independent as we can make them in a world where everybody is hyper-partisan. Um, but the really important thing is that those commissions have to abide by a set of criteria um, that include, uh, as well as the constitution, you know, no malapportionment. Um, it strengthens essentially the protections for minority voting rights. So it not only echoes what is in section two of the Voting Rights Act saying that communities of color should be able to vote together to elect their candidates of choice, but it also includes when voting in concert with other people, which means you don't have to have heavily overpacked um, majority minority districts. It means you can actually respond to the community where and, and how they exist. So that's one of the first criteria. It also says that um, you have to, uh, that the, the districts have to be essentially fair on a partisan basis. And it doesn't just say fair because that could mean anything. Um, uh, it, or we think it means one thing, but it could mean other things. Um, so it actually says that you have to use accepted measures of partisan fairness from the political science literature. Um, and so that was a, a big part of the litigation that CLC did in Wisconsin and in North Carolina. Um, there have been subsequent cases using that. So it, I think that would be a really strong protection um, for um, essentially the, the biggest excesses of, of um gerrymanders going one way or the other. It also includes protections for communities of interest, which is something that many states have, but not a majority. Um, so, so that would be a change as well. Um, and then it has a few other things in terms of if that gets sued for being unconstitutional, which we imagine that will happen, that case would go directly to um, the district court. And so we won't have these sort of Affordable Care Act, random cases, you know, milling their way up. Um, so yeah, so that, that I think is what um, are the important parts of, of HR1. Okay, um, I should explain HR1 uh, is the, it's HR1 of 2021. It's a little bit different to HR1 of 2019. It's the first bill introduced in the House. So HR1 of 2019 uh, was passed by the House, but didn't go anywhere in the Senate and the President didn't look at it. Um, the House hasn't voted yet on HR1 of 2021, but we hope that they will vote and approve it. Um, and I believe Leader Schumer has said he'll introduce the same bill um, as S1 in the Senate. Um, and so if there's a discrepancy between what gets passed, it'll go, it'll go to reconciliation. And then um, hopefully the president will sign it. Um, if that happens, that will be a just bombshell change, not only for redistricting, but for ethics, campaign finance, voting rights, rights restoration across the board. And if that happens, I can bet you that Jeanette and Chris and Delaney and Ellen and all of us will be talking to you about this nonstop. Um, now, if that doesn't happen, then we're back to let's try to keep the, um, the legislators fair, open and accessible. Um, okay, I think, oh wait, let me read my, yes, before we turn to questions from the audience, I just want to remind everyone that the report discussed during the call and the recording of this panel 
will be sent to you at the email address used to RSVP, RSVP for the event. Um, and we're now going to begin the Q&A session. So if you have a question for a member of the panel, please submit it in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube. Okay, I believe the question will appear. Here we go. If a state already has an IRC based on a state constitution, will HR1 completely override what's in the state's constitution? Um, I'm happy to discuss this unless anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, so basically if the IRC fulfills a set of criteria that are specifically listed in HR1, then it can continue to use that. So things like the California, Arizona and Michigan commissions, I think are pretty close, they are fine and they could just use them again. Um, there's also currently a carve out for Iowa. Um, I have no idea. I'm imagining maybe there's gonna be a West Virginia carve out, who knows? Um, but yeah, so it, it's possible that states could uh, could use their same, uh, their same IRC that they have at the moment. Um, and, and if not, then they may have a commission that they use for a state legislative process and then a separate commission that complies with HR1 for the congressional process. Does anyone want to add anything? <laughs> I think I might be the only one who's like geeking out on HR1. Um, okay, next question. Oh, from the League of Women Voters of Connecticut. Um, okay, I, how will the delay in census data affect states redistricting processes? Uh, Jeanette, do you want to start with that? <laughs> Sure, I can start with it uh, and then hopefully others can also chime in. I mean, the, the delay in the data is really going to create an even more compressed time frame, frankly, for most of the states to handle the redistricting process. So the data is going to come out. Uh, and in part, that's why some states, hopefully giving them the best, uh, assuming best intent here, that's why some states have started some of the public hearings already so that they can start collecting public input, even though they don't have the data yet but the data is gonna come out and you're still gonna be required to uh, undertake your redistricting in the same timeline unless you changed it legislatively or some other way. Um, so it's just gonna be even more compressed, which is why the groundwork now, the groundwork in advance is even more critical than in past years. Yeah, Chris, I know you've looked into some state quirks. I don't know if you wanna identify some of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I won't identify the specific states, but I'll say like the some, a lot of states actually have constitutionally mandated timelines about uh, when, you know, if the legislature is the one that's responsible for drawing uh, electoral districts, if they don't, then it, like in some states, it goes to a backup commission, for example. And so there is some concern that just with the delay in the census data by itself, that the the process of drawing these electoral districts will be completely different than from previous cycles not because of you know tension in the legislature or whatever else but solely because the census data is going to be delayed and so um i do think it's a uh i'm not sure there's an exact answer to the question like i, I think there are a lot of things that are sort of up in the air and people are flying by the seat of their pants but we'll see what happens yeah, I do worry it's going to lead to what happened in Illinois in the 2011 period, which was they had like 90 um, public hearings, then they drew plans, they had two public hearings, and then they passed them. And so the initial public hearings were kind of window dressing. And so I hope that with the delay, we still get a decent amount of public input. Okay, I think next question. I think what, I think what Ruth just elevated is really critical that the public input isn't just before it has to be after the maps are drawn, before they're passed, but after they've been drawn and introduced so that people can actually provide input so people can evaluate them so that there's opportunity to say, oh no, you've broken my community up or oh, we're not gonna be represented or whatever the case may be, that the public input timeframe has to be after the initial maps have been drawn, but before they've been passed, which also means giving people enough time to do the work that needs to be done to do the evaluation, right? So it's not that, which happens a lot, and uh, Ellen and others can probably speak to this, that we would find out, I mean, honestly, in 2010, 2011, we found out sometimes hours before a hearing was going to take place, at best days sometimes, right? And that's not enough time for people to do the evaluation that needs to be done on the maps so that you can have the good, strong public input and come up with the maps at the end of the day that truly represent the voters in that state. Okay, do we, oh, another question. Oh, okay, I just got to identify. This is from Debbie Patel. She is one of my clients, one of my plaintiffs in the Whitford litigation, long suffering Wisconsinite. <laughs> um, okay, thoughts on how to use the report to convince, encourage, or demand legislatures draw maps um, and follow the same rules that a commission should follow. Who wants to take that? 
Sorry, I can go. Um, I mean, I think some of it just comes down to almost like shaming politicians into doing the right thing, right? Of like, you know, what is the counter argument to re making sure that the data that the legislature relies on uh, to draw the maps is publicly available, right? Like there, there's not a strong counter argument for, oh, well, people shouldn't like be able to use the same data that the legislature did. Or um, in terms of, you know, the Freedom of Information Act and like Sunshine Laws, for example, like what's the counter argument to requiring the legislature to release like all of the, the conversations around the redistricting process, right? And so, I mean, on, on one hand, right, like in, in places that have a lot of, um, where there's one party is in control, right, it's, it's very difficult to uh, change the opinions of legislators when they don't have to. Um, but on the other, I mean, I, I think, you know, there are other ways to sort of achieve victories, right? And it's around, um, you know, public participation and getting public engagement to say, you know, even in Wisconsin, right? I don't remember the number, but they had a, like a county by county referendum on uh, the rules about partisan gerrymandering. And it's an overwhelming amount of counties in the state of Wisconsin are like, we don't want partisan gerrymandering in our legislature. And so I think one of the reasons why you see stuff like that is because um, sort of this disconnect between what the legislature wants to do and what the people in that state want to do, so. I think that's a really good point, Chris, um, that even though legislators may be divided on a partisan basis between what they want to do, the people are not divided. Like Republicans, Democrats, independents, everybody wants a fairer and more inclusive process. I mean, CLC did a, a poll a couple of years back where the, the results were that R's, D's and I's all said that they would favor a more fair process, as in taking it out of the hands of legislators, even if it meant their party would get less seats. Right. That, I mean, that is support. Um, so, yes, you have to fight against the powers that be that are in power, but you have a lot of support from people around around your state, imagine. Well, and I think there are two additional points to make related to sometimes there are rules on the books that are simply not being followed to begin with. So, you know, finding the mechanisms to enforce the rules that are currently there that are being ignored is a good step forward in many states. And then another one is, you know, what's the argument? The, the state legislators are usually accountable and have sunshine laws and ethics laws that are applicable to them. But for some reason, there's a carve out when it comes to redistricting. There's a carve out when it's the oftentimes because it happens in a special session or something, right? There's a different set of rules. What's the reasoning behind that? The public doesn't actually agree with that. They want to know what's going on. They want to know what their government is doing on their behalf so that they can judge whether or not it's truly on their behalf. And so, you know, even if you can't move something new, which hopefully you can still by, you know, talking with legislators or the commissioners, et cetera, but there are other mechanisms that are often available that just aren't even being used right now. That is a good point, Jeanette. Uh, I think, do we have a new question? Okay, this is from Sequim Alfonso. Can individual vote or group of voters sue redistricting efforts in states which deprive racial and ethnic minorities of equal access to representation? The short answer is yes. Who wants to give the long answer? <laughs> um, Ellen, I mean, was this part of your claim or no, you just focused on partisan gerrymandering? No, no, no. In, well, it depends. There, there, the longer answer is there are some protections under federal law and based on what Ruth was saying, and also we haven't talked about HR 4, which frankly, I'm sure you know much more about than I do, Ruth, but I know that there are protections in HR 4, which is the John Lewis voting rights. There's another word in there, but the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, there are some additional protections that would, if it, if it were to pass before redistricting. Um, it, would, it would provide additional pr protections in, under federal law, which could get you to federal court or, may, or state court. In, um, it depend to get to your state court, um, you would have to have some basis under your state court law um, that, that would get you to court. We did because of our amendments. Um, but, and you can bring, you know, violations of federal law in, in state courts too. So that's that's the longer answer, but probably no more informative, Ruth, than your very short answer. 
<laughs> well, no, I mean, I will say just because I mean, you bring up HR4. So I, I also realize this question may come about because people have heard of the Shelby County v. Holder decision from the last decade. Um, and so that struck down a provision of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but there are other provisions that still exist. So the general provision that essentially mirrors the 15th Amendment that says that you can't deprive the right to vote on account of race or colour applies to the entire country. So to that extent, you can use the Voting Rights Act um, as well as the Constitution to try to ensure that racial and ethnic minorities get equal access to representation. But what Ellen is talking about with HR4 would be, I think it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Act, because it would be amending the Voting Rights Act, the bit that got struck down, to actually add in these extra protections for with a history of discrimination. Um, and that would go back to the, the pre-Shelby um, framework. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing I guess to say is that it's not just the Voting Rights Act, but under the Constitution, under the 14th Amendment, you can bring a case alleging racial gerrymandering. Um, and those cases, there were cases brought in Alabama and North Carolina and Virginia very effectively in the last decade to stop essentially packing um, of, in, I think in all cases, black voters into districts. They would try to have 60 and 65% black districts when that wasn't necessary. And it was purely done to reduce the influence of black voters in the surrounding districts. Um, so, you know, it's not simple or straightforward, but there are causes of action um, and you should chat to all of us and we can help you get involved if, if you, <laughs> you know, need help. I, I'm sorry, does anyone have anything else to add? Okay, we can go to the next question. Oh, cute picture, Annie Dang. Um, is there any sort of national movement or collaboration across multiple states to help them reform their redistricting processes? Okay, sorry, Chris, this has got to be you to start. <laughs> I mean, the short answer again is yes, um, but I mean, there are lots of groups working in various states, right? I think League of Women Voters obviously is a very uh, good example of um, their, their 50 state platform that they're working on. Um, but I mean, the besides that though, yeah, I mean, there are lots of groups that are working on this. I mean, I think um, like Represent Us does a lot of work across the country. Common Cause also does a lot of work uh, across the country in this area too, so. Well, the thing that I would add that while the league, you know, we're running the People Powered Fair Maps, which is a league activity uh, across all 50 states in DC to reform the redistricting process. But there's all, this question gets to, how are we collaborating with one another? And, you know, you just mentioned a variety of groups and we are all in regular communication. I know that there's a group of kind of the people side, the organizing side of the organizations like Common Cause and the League and APIA Vote and others that are talking with one another on a regular basis. A lot of the legal teams that focus on or legal organizations that focus on redistricting are also talking with one another on a regular basis so that, you know, because we're going to have all this is going to happen in such a compressed time frame, everybody can't be everywhere at the same time. So if we're going to have an impact in ensuring that we're protecting people's voting rights through the redistricting process, we have to be coordinated. And so we are. We're we're giving it a real good try anyway. Uh, there with a lot of you know cross communication across the organizations. Um, I think we've had some requests to maybe go over the types of commissions again, which maybe will make more sense. Um, now that we've talked about all of this. So I, Jeanette, um, unless you really don't want to, I wonder if you could give us a brief overview <laughs> for everyone again. Sure. So there's basically four different kinds of commissions. There are independent redistricting commissions, there are political or bipartisan commissions, there are advisory commissions, and then there's backup commissions. The first two take the power away from the state legislatures and give them to another body. So either an independent redistricting commission or a political or bipartisan commission. Now, the difference between those two, one precludes elected officials from being a part of it, the independent redistricting commission, and the other one allows current elected officials to be part of it, the political slash bipartisan commissions. Now, the advisory commission is just advisory. It is what it says. It provides input, it can actually draw the first round of maps, it can draw its own maps while the legislature is doing things uh, in parallel. Frankly, the processes for all of these are different for every state. So you'd have to look into your state to see what the specific process looks like. But the advisory commissions can be accepted, ignored, but at the end of the day, the legislature has the, the final say. The backup commissions often are what come into play when the legislature can't actually come to an agreement or there's litigation or some other piece that ends up pushing the 
the, co the drawing process to what is considered the backup commission. They do have the final say at the end of the day, usually um, for drawing the, the maps. So only the advisory commission has very little power, but all of these commissions are, are very different in nature. I do want to add one little plug for the very unique Advisory Commission of Iowa. Um, I don't know, um, Delaney, if there's some term in ethics for this, but it's something about the norms of that state. It is technically an Advisory Commission. It is some demographers from who are very kind of nonpartisan, but the legislature, partisan though it is, has never ignored, they have never not done what the Advisory Commission suggested. Um, and so when people talk about wanting the Iowa model, I'm like, you're going to have to want whatever is in the water there that's making them always follow the advisory commission. Because <laughs> I wouldn't otherwise advise people set one up. Um, I don't know. I guess that's, I don't know. How does that happen, Delaney? Luck. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so wait, ethics without enforcement? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I've been in, you know, in rooms where people talk about the Iowa model. And I'm just like, well, you do need like that history of the legislature and that sort of stepping on the toes of, um, I, I can't remember the name. I think it's like the legislative services, something, yeah, something like that. um, that's responsible for drawing the lines. And it's just like, like, I, I don't know how you create that in this like hyper-partisan era and expect the legislature to not interfere. So, well, the, I think there is, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say the political culture in Iowa is different than other states in a lot of ways, right? Like they have the big caucus there. It's just, it's different. And I think what Chris mentioned as far as having the history before today of having the legislature not step on the advisory commission's toes uh, is, is really critical. And they were one of the originals, right? And so it, it was just a very different model. It, it's not really, something that is easily replicable today, given the political environment we're working in and, and other things. So one of the other commission models would definitely be advisable over the advisory. Um, and I think the last question that we have time for um, is a question on how to address the concerns um, about the impact of independent commissions on minority communities. Um, I'm gonna throw this to Chris because you get, got this question a lot. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are there are two ways to answer that question, right? I think the first step is getting a lot of people from minority communities to actually apply to be commissioners. Um, I think in Michigan, for example, in Michigan, the Secretary of State, I think, was required to send out, I think it's maybe like a couple thousand applications to be a commissioner, and she ended up sending out uh, way more than that. I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like exponentially higher. I think she was supposed to send out 10,000 and send out maybe like 20,000 or something. Um, and so I think the first step is getting people to apply to be commissioners. Um, and then I think the second step is that, you know, even if you aren't a commissioner, you're, you know, people from minority communities are still participating in the uh, commission's process, right? I, there's a story that I like absolutely love and tell all the time as though like I was the one that was there, but the story is that at the, like during the California commission process in 2011, um, there was this point where the commission drew the draft maps, right? And so they drew the draft maps and they put these two indigenous communities, uh, two indigenous tribes together in the same, uh, I think, uh, I don't remember which district, but it was one of the electoral districts together. And they were like, well, they're two indigenous tribes. And so of course they have like a lot of the same issues. And so therefore we're gonna put them together. The commission then goes on the constitutionally required public hearings across the state, right? And then Fast forward to the hearing that was in the area near where these two indigenous tribes were and members from both indigenous tribes show up and they're like, do not put us in the same indigenous tribe as this other, like as the other indigenous tribe. And so I just like love that story because one, right? Like the commission had no idea that these two indigenous tribes didn't want to be together. Um, but two, because the people from these tribes came together, uh, right? I guess not came together, but they both came separately to the same hearing, right? They were able to express their feelings and then the commission made sure that their, um, that the indigenous tribes like wishes were, were adhered to. Um, I think the, sorry, there's one more thing I'll say. And I think the third thing is sort of when drafting um, independent redistricting commission language, or just generally, I guess, um, is making sure that that commission has to, uh, you know, make sure that minority rep communities are properly represented and that their votes aren't diluted and that they're properly protected. Um, like, I, I can't remember the ranking in California, but like in Michigan, for example, I think what we call considered to be minority protection language, I think is the, the third factor. Like it's the, it's like the United States constitution is like follow the Michigan constitution. 
And then third is, you know, making sure that the minority communities are properly respected and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think that's my full answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Jeanette, did you want to jump in? Well, I, I do think in part what the question speaks to is that the community needs to participate and make sure their voices are heard. And when you move the power from the legislature to a commission, the process for engagement is different. We also hope the process for listening is different and taking feedback and taking the input into consideration and evaluating that feedback is different. And But it does put the onus on the communities, whether it's the legislative process or the the commission process, but it does put the onus on the communities to to stand up for themselves, talk about their communities, talk about their communities' needs, identify where the boundaries should be, or even as simple as Chris's example is, don't put us together. We don't care what your boundary is, but we don't want to be in the same boundary, right? That things like that are are very very important, but it is because the people have spoken up on behalf of themselves and told their own stories and talked about their own needs. Thank you. I see that we are at time. So I want to thank all of our members of our panel um, and all the viewers for joining us today. Um, redistricting lies at the heart of American democracy. Though changes to the boundaries of our state legislative and congressional districts, sorry, through changes, the redistricting process offers a once in a decade chance for us to work towards a more representative government that truly represents the population served. As the deadlines for finalizing districts approach, well, not soon, but you know, we uh, should do everything we can to ensure that the process is open, fair, and as accessible as possible. Elections should be determined by voters, not politicians who draw the maps. Um, please remember to visit campaignlegal.org to read and download Designing a Transparent and Ethical Redistricting Process, a guide to ensuring that the redistricting process is fair, open, and accessible. Um, a copy of the guide will also be emailed to the address you used to RSVP for today's event. Um, and if you have additional questions or want more information, please email us at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Uh, thank you again and have a good afternoon. <laughs>